we're all overusing the planet's resource capacity. That's what it, that's what's well known. What's a little bit less well known is that our ecological footprint, which is a book that was written by Bill Reese and, and his former student, Mathis Walker Nagel, in 1996 was saying it could be and it seems to be that way and it's turned out that it is that way that the whole human community is overusing the resource base of the planet. So uh, that's what was happening in the 1990s and Bill was the director of SCARP, the School for Community and Regional Planning at UBC and we, this is the second time that Bill has spoken to the World Federalist Movement. The last time was about seven years ago. And it's really very deeply important. It has been very and deeply important to us as World Federalists to understand what's going on. And all of us really want to hear whether or not, about whether or not the human community is inherently sustainable or unsustainable. So I want to ask you to join me in welcoming Bill Reese for his talk tonight. Thank you. We advertise ourselves as an intelligent species, a species capable of logical thought. We pretend that we are capable of forward planning. I teach in a planning school. Uh, we act as if we are compassionate toward others. Uh, recently there's been a great increase in the interest in human compassion. And yet if you look at the way we behave on the international stage, there's not much evidence of intelligence, <laughs> forward planning, or compassion. And I think perhaps the most recent uh, global example would be the, in my view, gross failure of the Copenhagen uh, talks around climate change. So the question to me is, well, what is going on here? Why is it that our self-image, uh, this notion that we are evidence of intelligent life on Earth, uh, seems to deviate so much from the facts of the matter? Now obviously much of what I'm going to say is open to interpretation and that's fair enough. Uh, I'm just going to give you my interpretation that comes to me as a biologist teaching though with uh, sociologists and economists and political scientists and so on. So a lot of their thinking has rubbed off on me and I've simply tried to insert a perspective that isn't all that common out there into the whole debate around global change and particularly humankind's relationship uh, to that change, uh, the fact that we have become the primary driver. Um, th this is one of the earlier more, I suppose, strident warnings of the difficulty we seem to be in. Going way back to 1992, the year of the Rio Conference on Environment and Development, which didn't get very far and I think in some ways this uh, statement was a response to that. This is the Union of Concerned Scientists issuing a warning to humanity. Um, many of the Nobel laureates in science signed on to this particular document, but the bottom line is pretty clear. A great change in our stewardship of the earth and life on it is required if vast misery is to be avoided and our global home is not to be irretrievably mutilated. That's not the usual modest reserve uh, language of science and so this is a rather outs outspoken statement coming as it does from the Union of Concerned Scientists. If you were to plot global events against the time that this particular statement came out, you would notice it had no effect whatsoever. So if we can leap ahead. This is a, a much more recent statement, a decade and a half later from the Millennium Ecosystem a Summary Report. I was a part of this document as were 10,000 other uh, scientists around the planet. The largest study ever taken of the state of the world's ecosystems, the systems that sustain human existence. And again, it comes out with a stark warning that human activity is putting such a strain on the natural functions of the earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain human endeavor that can no longer be taken for granted. Now again, not a, a, a reserved statement. 
The problem again is that uh, if we plot the actual impact of humankind on the planet, you cannot see any evidence of an awakening, of a coming to consciousness of the reality of that relationship, if indeed it is real. This is just a, a, a plot of the human ecological footprint. Now, this is something again that I've developed with my students. I want to define it for you. Your ecological footprint is simply the area of productive ecosystems required to produce the resources that you consume and to assimilate your waste output. And it's an exclusive area. Obviously the green land that you use can't be used by me. So we're all competing with each other for the limited biocapacity of the planet, whether we're conscious of it or not. Uh, here is the simple reality. The average human needs about two hectares to sustain the average lifestyle on Earth. Um, that includes the assimilation of carbon dioxide and other waste, but primarily uh, then its consumption in the third world, waste production to a very large extent enters into this in the first world. Canadians use about eight hectares. So we're four times above the world average. Americans almost 10 hectares, about 10 or five times above the world average. The point then is that the earth is growing in population, the per capita footprint consumption is increasing even faster, and so we pass sometimes in the 1980s the point at which the average consumption on earth exceeded the average capacity of the planet to maintain that level of consumption. So if you add up the total aggregate human ecological footprint, it is greater than the biocapacity of the planet. Now you can ask, well, how can that be? How can we be consuming more than there is? And the answer is by drawing down the bank account. Ecosystems are like bank accounts. They're productive assets. A fish stock will produce an annual interest of catchable fish without being depleted. A forest adds a couple of percent a year in terms of total biomass. We can harvest that sustainably. But if your forest is adding biomass at the rate of 2% per year and you're harvesting at 4 and 5 and 6% per year, you're depleting that asset. You've exceeded the productive capacity of the forest or the fish stock or the soil or whatever it might be. So we're in a state of overshoot, exceeding the productive capacity and assimilative capacity of the planet. That's what climate change is all about. More carbon dioxide then can be assimilated by the <coughs> photosynthetic processes of green plants. And for that reason, we can be in a state of overshoot for some considerable time before uh, a collapse is induced. Things are getting worse. This is a, a, a quote from a paper just a few months ago, well, I guess toward the end of 2008, so it's over a year old now. It was one of the very first papers in the science of climate literature which actually made a political statement. Scientists are generally uh, uh, refrain from getting engaged in political debate. They like to believe that their work is value neutral. They simply put it out there to be assessed by the people and by politicians. Uh, in this case, uh, Anderson was slapped on the wrist for having gotten his nose a little bit too far into the political pie. But the point is that the statement stands as a pretty remarkable one in the scientific literature. This study indicated that by examining uh, previously unaccounted for sources of carbon emissions and a number of other things that aren't included in the um, no standard models, that we're on a track to reach about 650 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere <laughs> later in this century. The pre-industrial level was 280 parts. We're already at 390 parts and the trajectory is an accelerating one. The rate of increase is increasing every year. At 650 parts per million, we can anticipate a global uh, temperature increase on average of about four degrees Celsius by the end of this century. To avoid this, they argued, that unless we can reconcile economic growth with unprecedented rates of decarbonization, we need to be reducing by about 6% per year our use of fossil fuels. Uh, the only way to do this <clears throat> in the present structure of the economy with current technologies is to talk about a planned economic recession, a planned withdrawal uh, from nature in the sense that uh, we cannot continue to sustain current levels of impact and ex expect to, to survive. 